inco joint. This is the facet for incudomalleal joint. It was attached here. You can see the facet on the malleus also. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, this is the uh, post uh, fossa incudis, incus buttress. I'm drilling out the uh, fossa incudis here. And here you have to be careful about the dome of the lateral semicircular canal. When you're drilling here, always concentrate on the dome of the lateral semicircular canal and make sure you're not accidentally drilling it out. And uh, usually, malleus, what we can do, we can retain it with the uh, flaps when we're doing the surgery and uh, amputate the uh, head of the malleus and retain the uh, handle of the malleus along with the flaps. But now, just for uh, better exposure, I'm just going to cut the, uh, remove the malleus so that I can show you the anatomy of the facial now better. I'm just cutting the tensor tendon. Yeah, Dr. Vinay. Yes, sir. Can you just uh, adjust the microscope and do fine focus? Yeah, one minute, sir. Is it focused on this uh, blood vessel here, on the process cochlear? Better. Yeah, better, better, better. Now, sir? No? Not fully, but better than before. Yeah, yeah now it is, now it is better. This area which has been left behind here is known as posterior buttress when you do modified radical mastoidectomy. So the area where which you see here, that is the posterior buttress. The area which is this one which is left here is the anterior buttress. So the second geno area is a little tricky to delineate, uh, especially when the uh, stapes is intact. You have to be very careful and use a small bird tip to uh, drill out the thin out the bone over the facial canal. Because on <coughs> one side you have the lateral semicircular canal and on the other side you have the stapes and you have a very uh, small working distance there to delineate the uh, second geno area and the distal horizontal segment. And also the bone is usually very thin and sometimes dehiscent, so you have to be very careful. Wash. So now what you are seeing is this is the lateral semicircular canal and the area which he is drilling is here, this is the facial canal. Sir, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah we can. We're changing the battery of the mic. Uh, yeah, so I was saying there's a very narrow area in which we have to work. On one side, you have the lateral semicircular canal, and on the other side, you'll have the stapes, and you have to be very careful while working there, and also be careful about any dehiscent facial nerve because the lateral, uh, the horizontal uh, facial nerve is very commonly dehiscent, and uh, one of the complications of facial nerve surgery is damaging the normal nerve fibers. So always be careful not to damage the normal nerve. Try to expose the nerve as widely as possible. At least 180 degree exposure is good to get good results following facial nerve surgery. 
again i'm working very close to the lateral semicircular canal but as you can see i'm not applying too much pressure gently polishing uh, the bone there and you can see that this is in continuation with the horizontal facial canal which have already delineated now i'll drill a little bit more of these cells these are the supralabyrinthine cells which you're seeing here so i'll drill that also in order to get a better exposure of the geniculate ganglion the first geno and the labyrinthine segment so these supralabyrinthine cells they are usually involved in uh, longitudinal fractures of the temporal bone so what happens in longitudinal fractures of temporal bone is the fracture line runs along the posterior bony meatal wall like this so the fracture line runs like this goes through the posterior bony meatal wall and it hits these bony fragments here and these are very loosely arranged cells so because of the force of the trauma these get separated and they go and press on the nerve here and that causes facial nerve palsy so to decompress the uh, for a good results in uh, facial nerve uh, uh, palsy secondary to longitudinal fracture of the temporal bone it is the supralabyrinthine cell area which is which has to be decompressed and the perigeniculate ganglion area of the facial nerve has to be decompressed the perigeniculate ganglion area consists of the geniculate ganglion the first genu greater superficial petrosal nerve and the labyrinthine segment so these are the areas which are commonly involved in cases of longitudinal fractures of the temporal bone so in fractures we usually go through the transcanal approach and do a transcanal facial nerve decompression so that is a very simple procedure i'll try to show it if i have time or maybe i can show the videos tomorrow what yeah, can you show the transected right tendon now yes 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 sir i'll just drill out a little bit more bone here and i'll show the uh, the tensor tendon actually cut out before uh, removing the malleus but it's still here the remnant is still there hello hello yeah Uh, this is the process cochlearyform is here so that is a very good landmark because even in chronic years the process cochlearyform is rarely eroded it is always consistently there and that is a good landmark for the facial nerve also here and uh, this is the tensor uh, tendon here tensor tendon will be attached to the neck of the malleus so i just cut the tensor tendon before removing the malleus uh, it is difficult to remove the malleus if the attachment is still intact and these are all the supralabyrinthine cells now i have delineated the nerve up to the horizontal segment this is the horizontal segment of the facial nerve this is the second genu and the rest of the vertical segment so now to further go proximally you have to fracture the process cochlearyformis <coughs> the best way to identify the uh, geniculate ganglion is to fracture the process cochlearyformis this is the process cochlearyformis i'm just going to keep this instrument at the base of the process cochlearyformis and lift it up so when you lift it up the tensor uh, the co process cochlearyformis goes away this is the tensor muscle which is uh, attached here and whatever is here this is the geniculate ganglion did you see that uh, soft tissue which came into view sir yeah this one this is the geniculate ganglion so this bone was like this covering the geniculate ganglion i just fractured it uh that's why for the beginners i am saying again uh, the neck of malleus is very important with the neck of malleus you can follow the uh, uh tendon and to the processus cochlearyformis cure it small small yeah this too big even the horizontal portion of the facial canal goes anteriorly at the level of the processus cochlearis formis it takes a turn superiorly suction the medial wall so it is not exactly in line with the horizontal portion of the facial canal anterior to that so whenever you are drilling in that, that area you have to be careful like these cells if you are clearing 
in cases of cholestoma surgery so here if you, you this is the area which is safe you can clear it but this area where is suction is there that area is not safe because that house is the uh, the first genu yes <coughs> so the bone is a little hard here still so i'm using yes. a curate Then I have. So these curettes are very safe because posteriorly you can see it is quite blunt. So even if it is sitting on the nerve, it is not damaging any nerve fibers. Only thing is you should be careful about the direction of curetting. You shouldn't go and hit the nerve. So always curette away from the direction of the nerve. And here, of course, you should be careful about the tegmen also. If uh, the dura is exposed, you should be very careful. Now I've gone almost up to the first geno. The bone here is thicker than what we usually see, so I'm finding it difficult to curate it out. But always take your time and do it patiently. So when the bone is thin, you can use a side knife. When it is very thick, you can use a curet. This is the geniculate ganglion and almost the beginning of the first geno here. And here, when I'm lifting the nerve, you can see that the nerve is taking a turn. So that is the first genu and the beginning of the labyrinthine segment. So if I remove this bit of bone, you will see the labyrinthine segment. And here, you will see the greater superficial petrosal nerve. I have to remove this bone here to see the greater superficial petrosal nerve. But the bone here is unusually thick. Any questions from the juniors? So you must ask questions. If you have any doubts, don't hesitate. First 
now what you're seeing is the GSPN. I'll just show you. Code pick. Ah, it's here. Got it. You can see the soft structure which is yes, that, that is first gen yes. is exposing the area of the GSPN. GSPN. Greater superficial petrosal now. One wash. Flush. Wash, wash with force here where my instrument is there. Yes. Once more. Once more. Yeah. <coughs> Give me a smaller suction. Small suction. <coughs> so now if you see here, it looks like the facial nerve is going in this direction. But actually, the nerve is taking a turn here. And what you're seeing here, this is the greater superficial petrosal nerve. So this is the greater superficial petrosal nerve, which I'm hooking now with my instrument. This is the GSPN. This is the first geno. And if I lift the nerve like this, you can see that the nerve is taking a turn here. Is it clear, sir? Yeah, yeah. The nerve is taking a turn here. This is the beginning of the labyrinthine segment. Yeah, we can appreciate it. Geno. This bend is the first geno. This is the turn, which is the first geno. Whatever is going deeper is the labyrinthine segment. This is the geniculate ganglion. And this whole thing is the GSPN, what I'm hooking with the instrument. You can almost see a canal there, though that is the canal for GSPN. This is the greater superficial petrosal nerve. Yeah, now I've hooked it with the instrument. This is the greater superficial petrosal nerve. So topo diagnostic tests are very important to find the location of the lesion of the facial nerve. If the Schirmer's test is absent, that is, if the lacrimation is, uh, uh, lacrimation is present, it means Schirmer's test is negative. That means that the lesion is distal to the level of the GSPN. Distal is this side, proximal is towards the brainstem. If the lacrimation is absent, that is Schirmer's is positive, it means that the uh, lesion is proximal to the GSPN and the uh, geniculate ganglion. So in cases of longitudinal fracture of the temporal bone where this area is involved, lacrimation will always be absent when you do Schirmer's test preoperatively. And that gives a very good clue about the site of the lesion and the area of the facial nerve which is involved in the uh, pathology. So in cases of Bell's palsy, the commonest site of narrowing what you find is in this area. The labyrinthine segment is the narrowest segment. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, in books, it is described that uh, uh, labyrinthine segment is involved, but we have a large series of uh, Bell's palsy where we've seen that it is the vertical segment which is actually involved in uh, case of yeah. Bell's palsy. Uh, we have a paper also. Uh, so what we've done, uh, we've done a lot of studies and it is always the vertical segment. The sheath in the vertical segment or the epineurium is very thick. And in yeah. Bell's palsy, there is inflammation of that thick sheath, and that compresses the nerve and causes uh, facial nerve palsy. So I'll just incise the sheath next once I uh, expose a little bit more of the vertical what segment. What I mean to say is that even if labyrinthine segment is involved, in some cases, you can decompress this through this approach. You do not require a middle canal fossa approach. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. You can fact, de decompress it. In fact, we decompress this to through the transcanal approach also, sir. So if yeah, you have yeah. time, I'll show you that. So that is a very simple procedure, especially in cases of uh, road traffic accidents, uh, longitudinal fractures of the temporal bone. The transcanal approach is 
very useful in such cases yeah yeah this is a very good demonstration even for mbbs students those who dissect on cadavers in the first year uh, even if you do your best you'll never be able to dissect uh, gspn <laughs> so <laughs> if if there is any mbbs student in the in the audience it's a good demonstration of gspn he can tell his friends that he saw gspn today get a superficial petrosol now so is there anybody from anatomy department they are in the dh huh? they are in the dh they are in the dh okay so those who are in the dh and uh, they should uh, have a good look and they can tell their friends and colleagues that they saw the dissection of uh, get a superficial petrosol now and uh, you can try it later in in your cadavers can trace the gsp and even more it goes to the middle cranial fossa eventually yes yes because the dura is exposed a little bit here so i have to be careful while curating cord pick the ampulla of the superior semicircular canal that yes that is uh, actually a little far away only yeah so, and it is always safer to curate because the bone over the labyrinth is very thick it is not possible to damage the semicircular canals with the curate uh, but if you are drilling you have to be careful about the uh, posterior semicircular canal so now you can very clearly see this is the first genu and what you are seeing going down is the labyrinthine segment yeah the labyrinthine segment one. is the shortest and the narrowest uh, segment as sir was saying so you can see i have lifted up the nerve here what you're seeing is the labyrinthine segment my instrument is near the first genu where the nerve is taking a turn this is the geniculate ganglion i'll show you the gspn once more you can see the posterior the space between the genu and the labyrinthine segment here yes this is the gspn here so my instrument is hooked below the gspn This is the GSPN. Is Beautiful is done. Yeah. You can have an applause for Dr. Vijayan here, please. So everybody is so appreciative of your efforts, Dr. Thank Vijayan. you, sir. Thank you very much. It's a good part of. Uh, so this is the labyrinthine segment. First, you know, this is the horizontal segment here. The second, you know, is usually close to the pyramidalis process level, and the vertical segment. i'm still uh, i still have to expose a little bit of uh, nerve here because like i was saying for good results in facial nerve surgery at least 180 degrees of the nerve has to be decompressed so there's still a little bit of bone around the vertical segment i'll drill that and then i'll go to incise the sheath see for all the postgraduate students who are sitting here once you read the bell's palsy then uh, there is a lot of controversy where is the site of uh, the lesion so one of the theories is that it is near the labyrinthine segment and for decompression of that segment they said that you use middle cranial fossa, fossa approach but you can see here very clearly then if in if it is labyrinthine segment is involved you can decompress it through this approach or as popularized by dr bijend this permeatal approach also you can decompress it so this color change you are seeing very clearly this is the no double knife double knife Doctor Vinay, what is barber technique? Yes, sir. Barber polling technique is uh, very important to know. So, when you are uh, drilling the vertical segment of the facial nerve, you always drill posteriorly to avoid damage to the cauda tympani. Near the second genu, you have to work uh, inferiorly so that you don't damage the. Sorry, you have to work laterally so that you don't damage the lateral semicircular canal or the stapes. and when you go to the horizontal uh, 
horizontal segment, you have to work inferiorly to avoid damage to the lateral semicircular canal. So this change in direction of your uh, bird tip in uh, different segments of the uh, decompression of facial nerve is called the barber polling technique. So basically it is to avoid damage to the critical structures while you are trying to delineate the facial nerve. Yes, yes. Cure it. So never drill the nerve through and through. Always try to make the bone thin and then use blunt instruments like curate or a side knife, which I was doing there. Smaller curate. Here you can see the cord uh, facial angle very clearly now. The cord tympani is taking origin here. Is it focused, sir? Yeah, yeah, you can see. This is the cord facial angle, very clearly seen. This one. Here, this is the origin of the cord tympani. See how closely it is arising from the uh, stylomastoid foramen area. This is the stylomastoid foramen area. Yes, sir. This is the origin of the cord tympani. So now I'm happy with the delineation of the nerve. But to complete the decompression, I always like to incise the facial nerve sheath. Because whenever there is pathology of the facial nerve, the perineurium will be under tremendous pressure. And once you incise the sheath, the pressure is relieved and only then you will get good results in facial nerve surgery. Uh, tenotome. Yeah. I want the smallest, smallest suction. So for this, I use what is called a tenotome. This is the instrument called the tenotome. The posterior end is very blunt, but the it has a beveled edge here anteriorly, which will help to incise the facial nerve sheath. So when I cut the sheath, you can notice the change in thickness of the nerve sheath. As you go from distal to proximal, it becomes more thin. So the vertical segment, the nerve sheath is the thickest. Is the focus OK, sir? Now it's okay? Yeah, slightly less you can focus it. Now it's yeah, okay. yeah, you okay, know. Okay. It's okay. So now you can see it is a very thick sheath here. So what you're seeing here, this is the healthy perineurium. What I'm incising is the epineurium. What you're seeing inside is the healthy perineurium. So in case of Bell's palsy, this epineurium becomes even more thick and it becomes very difficult to incise and we have to use iris scissors sometimes to cut the sheath because it becomes, becomes uh, inflamed so much. See even here, it is quite thick near the vertical segment and the second geno. So I've done a study on the uh, change in facial nerve sheath, uh, uh, facial, ne facial nerve sheath thickness in uh, each segment of the facial nerve for which uh, I won the RAF Cooper Award uh, about three years back. So I found that the sheet thickness is the maximum at the vertical segment. It becomes a little more thin at the second geno. Horizontal <coughs> segment, the facial nerve sheath is very thin. Geniculate ganglion is the thinnest. And usually the labyrinthine segment does not have any sheath. So this is important because when you're doing facial nerve surgery, you have to know how much pressure you have to apply in each segment of the nerve. And also, when you're clearing the disease over the facial nerve, in case of cholesteatoma or any keratosis or anything involving the facial nerve, it is always easier to deal with the pathology in the vertical segment because the sheath is thick and it provides a protective coating. And it is not as fragile as the horizontal segment. When the horizontal segment is involved, you have to be very careful because the sheath is very thin and you may end up damaging the perineurium inside. So now I'm coming close to the horizontal segment. You will see that the sheath becomes more thin here. 
and it gets easily sliced. There are still a little bit of bony fragments here. Now you see it is so thin and transparent and it gets easily lifted up. Uh, one thing I would say to be appreciated is the second genu is actually a very smooth curve and it's the first genu which is quite acute. Yes, yes sir, yes. Actually, you have to say that it's uh, bending but actually when you're dissecting you feel that it's, it's the same smooth, thing line going in a smooth turn. Very yeah. curve. So and secondly, when uh, I started doing ENT those days, there was a lot of emphasis on uh, decompression of uh, uh, facial nerve in Bell's palsy cases. So we used to do a lot of uh, decompression in Bell's palsy, yes, even though they would, uh, palsy was not complete. In partial palsy also we were doing sometimes, yes, and uh, the literature that time said that the quality of uh, recovery and the speed of recovery is faster after you do the decompression as compared to the cases which were not decompressed. And okay. there were many uh, studies published at that time. Yes, sir. Now gradually uh, they say that uh, should not decompress unless it is a uh, total palsy and things like that. Yes. So at times yes. I fear that uh, are we making more of uh, ENT physicians than surgeons? Similarly, you have this uh, ZAC decompression also. Yes. There was a time when we were doing uh, many, many SAC decompression cases. Yes. I have my own series of about and more around 100 uh, SAC decompressions. But uh, then came the rule that uh, shouldn't decompress. <laughs> so that's how things change. But uh, there is definitely um, a role that there's nothing like yes, absolute. Sir, yes, but the first so, line of management for Bell's palsy is always medical. Only yeah, yeah. in unrecovered Bell's palsy after medical line of management, which is probably about 10% of the patients, we uh, take them up for surgery. And that's what I'm saying, that there yes. is, you cannot deny that there is absolutely yes, sir, no... Yes. Uh, Otherwise, the patient remains with uh, facial palsy for the rest of their lives, if they don't and undergo the surgery. If a physician refers them to you, you also would say that now there's no use of decompression. Yeah, yeah. So here you can see that the sheath became very thin when I moved towards the first geno. So now I'm happy with the decompression. Uh, you can see the very healthy looking perineurium ball pro flush. That's your only somewhere. Ball pro is your <laughs> So now I'll just show the entire anatomy of the facial nerve and then I think we will break for lunch. So starting from the stylomastoid foramen here, this was close to the digastric tendon. This is the vertical segment of the facial nerve. I'll just try to slowly separate the perineurium also just to show the anatomy better. So you can see the perineurium looking very healthy. This is the area of the second geno. This is the horizontal segment. This is the sheath which I incised, which is stuck here. This is the GSPN. This is the GSPN here. This is the first geno where the nerve is taking a turn and when I lift the nerve you can see the beginning of the labyrinthine segment. This is the labyrinthine segment. I can go a little bit more, I can curate out the bone but it is not needed right now. So if you keep curating you will reach up to the meatal foramen opening. So this is how you can decompress the complete nerve 
from the uh, meatal foramen up to the stylomastoid foramen through the transmastoid uh, approach. It is a very, very important procedure because everybody is scared about the facial nerve. And unless you do repeated uh, facial nerve decompressions on a cadaveric bone, you will not have the confidence to do your surgery. And of course, you can see the corda tympani here. This is the corda tympani. Uh, facial nerve decompression, for whatever reason, uh, is it important to decompress the entire extent, horizontal and vertical, or just the focal area where the pathology is? Just the area which is involved, but a little bit of the normal nerve has to be decompressed both distally and proximally, because you have to give nerve to uh, expand. In case this is the area involved, decompress about one centimeter uh, proximally and distally and uh, incise the sheath up till there. So it will evenly, uh, the pressure spreads out evenly and results will be better. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Shall I continue or lunch? Sorry, sir. Okay, okay. So any more questions about the facial nerve? I'll just uh, thin out this bone uh, over the sigmoid sinus uh, and the tegmen. Hello, Dr. Dr. Vinay. Yes, sir. Uh, somebody from the audience he wants to ask you, can you show us how to uh, cut the nerve and uh, put a graft or repair? Uh, yeah. Mm, for that, I need another graph. Uh, I'll show that at the end, sir, because I want to show the entire course of the facial nerve when I go to the internotary meatus. Sure, sure. Uh, please remind me in the end. I'll just uh, uh, show you how it can be done. Right now, I want the facial nerve to be intact. Sure. Yeah. But of course, the facial nerve is completely exposed now. <clears throat> there are good chances that it might get caught in the bird tip when I'm drilling. Um, so uh, the next step would be to delineate the semicircular canals. <coughs> and, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Vinay, yes, sir. Uh, you can uh, take a break and uh, we can uh, go for lunch together. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Because, uh, uh, sure, sir. Yeah. Yeah. They said yeah. lunch will be ready in five minutes. So yes. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. five minutes. You can take five minutes. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just preparing this for the next uh, exercise. Yeah, sure. yeah. Next will yeah. be uh, delineating of the de <coughs> delineation of the semicircular canals, and also an endolymphatic sac decompression. So to do uh, uh, endolymphatic sac decompression, one has to drill out the Posterofossa dura and also remove all the bone over the sigmoid sinus. So these are all air cells here. You can easily make out the dis difference between the air cells and when you find the semicircular canal. What you're seeing here, this yellow color, that is the superior semicircular canal. But it's still hidden beneath uh, a few air cells, which I still have to drill out. Dr. Vinay, we are all uh, ready to break for lunch. Sure, sir. So, yeah. And uh, please come and join us there. Okay, sir. We'll stop. So we'll yeah. continue after the break. Thank you, sir. Yeah, okay. <coughs> thank you, thank you. Thanks. <coughs> 